Hello everybody. So I'm talking about quite a different context here from the one that Gillian's outlined insofar as I'm talking about video for stimulated dialogue. So the video itself isn't the data. That's the important thing to say. The video is being used to stimulate conversations in focus groups that follow teaching. So I'll talk a bit more about that, but it's just something I wanted to say right from the outset. So you're not going to see a lot of video. It's unfortunately one of the sort of sad outcomes of that because <laughs> I really enjoyed seeing so much video and you know the, the things that were happening in a really rich presentation from Gillian. So uh, I'm on the Pedagogy of Methodological Learning Project. Uh, this is about how research methods are taught and learned. And it's uh, an interesting area because there is research on learning and teaching, but it tends to be quite a um, fragmented literature. It tends to be based on individual reflections by individual teachers on how they're um, teaching is going with maybe one group of students. There doesn't tend to be cross-citation, it can be siloed within disciplines. So it, it was really time that we had took a kind of cross-case analysis view of what's happening in research methods teaching. Particularly as research methods teaching can be um, quite unique insofar as it has uh, places particular demands on students. It requires technical understanding, it requires procedural knowledge, sorry, technical skill, procedural understanding as well as that kind of conceptual theoretical work that's required. So, so yeah, it places demands on teachers, it places demands on students and it was time to sort of take a deep look at this. The other thing that's worth saying early on is that there's this, this kind of fragmentation leads to a lack of pedagogic culture. You don't see sort of uh, a lot of developed arguments in the literature, there isn't a back and forth, there isn't a sense of shared understanding of what pedagogy is. So, Teachers will generally depend on uh, their own experiences, trial and error, a small group of peers, or as I say, this, this small literature. So we're really interested not only in investigating what's happening in this space, but also looking at pedagogic culture and how we can um, provoke it, build pedagogic culture at the same time as investigating it. Um, so we call this Methods That Teach, and myself and Melanie Nines, who's in the audience, um, have a paper coming out, which, some of which I'm going to be unpacking here. Um, so amongst the methods we've used, and we've used, we've used um, diary methods, we've used expert panel interviews, um, we've also used video stimulated recall reflection and dialogue. So this is taking it from that reflective space where you ask people what they do in the classroom to actually going into the classroom and finding out what people actually do. So giving a different level of granularity uh, in, in terms of, of getting at many of these tacit practices that um, Gillian's already touched upon. Um, and in particular, it, it's worth saying, uh, and Melanie's written on this, um, Nine Detail in 2016, pedagogy can be seen to be hard to know because a lot of it is about the tacit as well as the explicit in terms of what people do. Um, so getting that granularity of seeing what people do is, is really valuable. So in this situation, I'm talking loudly <laughs> so you can all hear me. These are kind of the small pedagogic actions as well as you know, the, the steps that I may be taking to structure the presentation and et cetera, et cetera. So if you, you might say, you know, if you look at Foucault's writing on power, power is everywhere. I think there's some arguments say that pedagogy is everywhere. You know, learn, learning takes place and it's trying to understand these internal as well as external processes. And video can be a rich way of entering this space and um, provoking discussion about what's happening. The other thing that I would like to say um, is that we were really interested in ensuring a alongsider perspective, which um, Carol wrote about in 2009. Um, it's, so there's a couple of other things to say. So we're about sort of surfacing and articulating some of impl implicit pedagogies. Um, and it's worth saying that within pedagogic research, um, video methods serve different functions and are used in different ways, but because we knew we were going to be talking to teachers and students who didn't necessarily come from an educational background themselves. We really needed a method um, that didn't rely upon a pedagogic repertoire in terms of how they could talk about what was happening. 
So in that respect, the, the research is a little different to other educational research that you might see. It's not like um, Japanese lesson study uh, or sort of standard observational methods. It was about trying to provoke these conversations where maybe they hadn't happened before. So um, it's worth saying that the researchers I've worked with Mel on this project and um, Daniel Kilburn and Rose Wiles have also worked on previous iterations of the project. Um, we, are, we do teaching, we do research methods and we wanted to make sure the research was uh, focusing with participants on what was happening, not focusing on them. And this is where video inducts obviously quite a, a difficult um, space in the sense of as soon as a camera is in the room <laughs> and I'm looking at the camera, you feel it on you. <laughs> so finding ways to kind of deconstruct the sense in which there's, there's a, um, what I suppose you could say, the unequal gaze that we see in the writings of Foucault and others um, and have been deconstructed in really helpful ways um, about the masculinist gaze from um, feminist writers. We, we really wanted to respect teachers' agency as knowers and producers of knowledge and engage them in developing shared knowledges and collective understandings. Um, and this is contrary to a lot of best practice kind of discourse that we see, particularly in higher education. Um, we weren't wanting to evaluate teachers and come in and act like we knew what was the best thing to do or say this is bad practice, this is good practice. It was really about trying to evoke and understand what's happening in these spaces. And, and I've got a little side note on power here, um, which is uh, our potential teacher and learner participants cannot hardly be seen as um, marginalised or subjugated people kicking back against research that's harmed them. Yet we still did not want a power dynamic that put us in charge of their experiences. Even in academia, which some see as a rarefied elite and privileged space, is a place where community dialogue through and about pedagogy can be seen to be marginalised or occluded by the effects of neoliberalism on the university. So specifically issues like the marketisation of higher education can push discourse away from pedagogy and towards kind of metrics and consumerism, despite substantial educational cultural capital that academics have accrued, and you see uh, Gil write about this, um, they're still compelled to act in highly individualised ways. With the discipline as the locus around which academic identities gravitate, um, teachers often identify more strongly with disciplinary research roles and methods culture rather than having a fully fledged or pedagogically informed teacher educator identity. So in this kind of contested field where teaching, learning, research can be divided as if they are not part of a relationship, it was important for us to kind of use methods that freed us from this dynamic um, of division, regulation and instead support shared community dialogue. So, what did we actually do? Um, the first phase of the research was about going into short course uh, situations and there'll be a day of filming and then at the end of the day, after the training, the teacher training, sorry, the teaching had taken place, we'd run a focus group straight afterwards. So there was a lot of, sort of process work, technical work to get the video in a state where it had been digested and then could be used with a focus group. So then it's about getting learners and teachers together in groups of sort of uh, five, six, seven to talk about what had happened during the training. So again, to reiterate, the, the video itself was used as a stimulus for dialogue within that focus group. It wasn't used subsequently. So there's an important sort of distinction in terms of how we use the video and how our participants understand that the video is used. Uh, in the second phase, uh, there were two more short courses <coughs> and a seminar used as part of a case study. Um, so, so in terms of material discourses of what happened, we used these very small cameras, um, which is interesting insofar as, in some sense, you don't have a big camera that fills the room, but then do you move into these kind of more covert <laughs> discursive practices of covert filming. Um, I think certainly people notice where cameras are in a space and so I will talk a little bit about the organisation of space and filming which I think is a really interesting dynamic to sort of look into. So these two cameras, one, one is a, an HD camera webcam which is literally you know, the size of my fist and the other one 
is an action cam which we used in a static way, both fed into a laptop, which means you don't have, the, um, you don't have to worry about you know, running out of tape. And these obviously give you different fields of view. So a handheld camcorder might give you an, a narrow field of view, but if you start to use things like action cams, this can give you, you know, up to, up to 300 and <laughs> nearly 360 degrees of filming. But that gives you a fishbowl effect, which Again, it's, it's quite, I mean, I come, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, time for postmodernism and so forth. You talk about decentering, and the fishbowl is almost the ultimate decentering camera because the person sitting in front of the fishbowl lens will be in the distance, and everybody around the edges is kind of enlarged, which again raises questions about who, where people think they are <laughs> in relation to the camera, in relation to the data collection, and, oh, sorry, not the data collection, the video collection, and what's happening. So this would be the kind of view you'd see from a handheld camcorder in a small classroom. This is more of your kind of action cam, fisheye lens. So the next question is how we then play that back. Um, and these slides will be available after if anybody wants to um, have copies. Um, and these two viewpoints on the classroom, trying to capture activity in the round, is challenging. Classrooms are particularly challenging uh, environments to record in. Um, for reasons which are kind of spelled out in this kind of space where you might have um, peripheral noise, you might have squeaking desks, moving things, all sorts of things that can interrupt filming. Not to mention, you know, the teacher that stands up and says, it's a beautiful day, let's go outside. Uh, so <laughs> the whole question of the kinds of cameras that you use and how you're prepared for what kinds of activities is a really big question. But in terms of playing back, um, it seems there's two useful ways of doing it. There's picture in picture, so we would have uh, one camera focused on the person at the front of the class, the second from the front of the class onto the kind of seated face back at the students. Um, and within that you can then, when you play back, get both views simultaneously. That, that would be a kind of show everything approach to extracting clips to play back. Um, and the other way to sort of handle that, uh, sorry, would be um, to maybe take a more di directorial approach where you maybe flip between the cameras and you're in control of that as a researcher. Um, the tension there is obvious, obviously about who's in control of the camera and where attention is being directed as you're using this as a stimulus back to the participants. So talk about a little bit more about that in a second. So a note on dialogue. Um, we're looking now for sort of social rather than individual reflective thinking in a two-way scaffolded discussion between research partners. Um, Moyles et al. talk about a synergic, synerg synergetic pooling of information that extends understanding of the concepts explored, which I think we see in this, these ambitions towards a method that teaches. Um, but there's this question, I think, which I want to bring out more about how does the use of cameras order space and participation in the methods classroom? Um, importantly, we've got uh, a paper by uh, Ninda Tao, which will be in the references for this presentation, about this dialogic aspect of the research. There's also a really great paper, a working paper by Daniel Kilburn on the NCRM uh, eprints, which is about the use of cameras in the classroom. So if you want the technical or if you want the dialogic, I advise you to go and check those out. I'm going to talk about sort of some of the sticky areas in between, which is firstly noticing that the organisation of space for learning is, is often in conflict with the organisation of space for data collection. And the interactions, I suppose what I want to say is the interactions that shape the data begin before the class and the video recording starts. So if cameras order the space and you're setting up before the students and teachers walk into that space, what they notice, how they organise themselves in the room accordingly, is I think where the interactions about what's going to constitute your data begin to happen. Um, and as I say, there's ways we've handled this. One is about this use of the small cameras, and um, we use them with clamp mounts that could be mounted on windows or any kind of shiny surface like uh, whiteboards. Um, but when you're going into a classroom that's not your classroom, and we were going around the country to sort of do this filming, you never know what you're going to get. And for example, uh, one rather marvelous um, suite where some very high profile training was taking place, um, it, it had these kind of um, 
mirrors that with gold embossed kind of surrounds and I was so grateful that I could clamp my cameras onto these sort of golden mirrors in this uh, rather special space um, but that there's what's possible as well as what's desirable in terms of organizing where cameras are and then there's sort of what's on screen and so one thing we try to do in terms of breaking down this notion of researcher researched was that I would set up um, the researcher laptop where the video streaming to in a place where participants could see it as they entered the room so I'm going to play this but without sound because I don't think it needs sound so um, this is an example of me moving around the space so you can see the hopefully um, the different camera angles showing what's happening where and that's kind of over shoulder view so it's sort of implicitly starting to draw participants into an understanding of what what's happening in the classroom and of course you can send all the um, advanced materials and you know your consent forms and your ethical guidance and etc etc but when you get to these locations people will look at you and think who are you because you know, they just didn't see that email or they saw it but they didn't really read it and there have been those occasions you know where a teacher will introduce the class introduce themselves everybody talks about themselves and then literally the whole class is turned around to look at us in a kind of a and who are you and <laughs> what are you going to tell us you're doing so so um, that sort of notes from the field shall we say so on the selection of um, <coughs> excerpts, this, this is where the, um, the question of who leads and how power relations are sort of managed <coughs> becomes most explicit. There's this question of who selects video excerpts. Um, through a day, as a researcher, you'll have a sense of which there are particular things that are of interest to you, of course, but you don't want to dis um, foreclose on those instances where as Gillian has really uh, eloquently articulated, what's visible to me as a researcher is not necessarily what's happening within the room, um, that, that, that the visible practices um, may get in the way of the invisible practices or the implicit practices. And this is where you, know, you need that um, skillful uh, use of dialogue within the um, focus group setting. Of course, it's not possible necessarily to engage all students or all participants after an event in the discussion of the material that you've produced. So that question of who takes place in the dialogue, who can see what is a really difficult question. And then there are these related issues of collaboration versus judgment, distinct or shared goals, high focus versus open agenda, and ownership versus done to this question of managing vulnerability and across the transcripts coming out of our focus groups you have that thing of oh looking at myself on camera that's painful you know these kinds of regular things about the, the opening discussion of getting through the fact that there we all are on camera and it, it's not a comfortable experience necessarily so yeah there's this question research led participant led or play everything and you see that play out in, in different kinds of research so I've got uh, a few short examples of some of the things that came out of our conversations and as one learner explained, um, this uh, coming to a shared understanding was something that uh, you know, we weren't looking for consensus on, on the teaching or the teaching environment. But what was interesting was the way that pedagogy could become more visible through these conversations that reflected on the stimulus. And here's one example where one learner explained to the teacher, you wanted a reaction because you kept going and you moved around and you kind of sat down and you said, shall I say it again? You know, these ways in which people notice and understand, maybe even when a teacher isn't aware of quite what they're doing because they're so in the moment. There's also the kind of non-discursive discourses <laughs> to use, a, uh, a, again, a kind of Foucauldian non-discursive discourses being the discourses that aren't about talk, the unspoken, they might be material or what have you, but this was a really nice quote from um, one student who said about, is not talking though a sign of not being included? Because I know when I speak, I often choose the moments I want to speak in, and I can come across as quite quiet sometimes, and it's not because I don't feel included necessarily. So again, this thing about what, where are the silences, how can they be interpreted, what what might they mean, what are they signifying, 
is up for debate and usefully generative. And then there's also the notion of the kind of subterranean discourses, which um, I've got an example which is extensive um, from a ethnographic arts technique, small group, whole group discussion. So there was a clip where um, a group would come back together to discuss their small group work in a scenario that many of us in higher education will find familiar. Everybody comes back and then the qu questions and ideas are kind of pinging around a bit. Um, and so there's a back and forth between some members of the group. But the members of the group who were generally talking were not members of the group who were then in our focus group later. So this was a chance for us to get a sense of what the whole class made of that moment, as opposed to maybe just the people reflecting in that instant and passing around uh, uh, the talk. So, um, yeah, so the interviewer says, I kind of see empathy in that exchange. Carl, a student, says, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were trying to grapple with what we had done, so it showed a lot, obviously. And Silas says, there's a commonality in the topics as well, sort of, you know, just by the different subject areas, you could all relate to that issue. And I think that was quite an interesting point that allowed everybody potentially to contribute. But when it just seems like we're starting to get the ball rolling and everybody's agreeing that, that, that yes, there was something generative happening in this pedagogic moment, Cassandra pitches in. At the same time, I did feel that everyone who spoke in that moment was someone who said, I just sat down and wrote this. It took me five minutes and I wasn't that experienced. And I wasn't about to stick my hand up and be like, actually, I enjoyed it, but I spent a lot of time doing this. So you have that sort of counter perspective. And Carl says, that's what I mean. Rennie says, and this is the teaching assistant now who comes in. Yes, it's interesting because I remember, I feel like that kind of was bouncing around. But I remember when we started talking about temporality, my group didn't touch on that at all. None of us participated in that. And I remember it taking a while because I kept thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to enter this? And it was kind of your point. I feel like when we're moving between the small group and the big group, a lot of that jump is it's, there was an invitation to talk about what we discussed in the smaller groups. And I don't know, I think it was a jump in intimacy. And if you don't have that kind of, oh, me too, there, it's hard to counter in a bigger room because you don't have trust with everyone yet. So it was just really interesting to sort of unpack a moment where there was seemingly a moment of consensus or a role of ideas, but there was, there was no maybe social opportunity to unpack that within the class itself.